Welcome back, fantasy fiction fanatics. It's great to see you again, and I hope you're doing well. Today, I thought it would be fun to talk about six different classic high fantasy tropes that we see in different high fantasy stories, um, and just see what you think about them, what I think about them, and what kind of elements they add to a story. Um, if you end up liking this list in this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, please, we would love to have you as part of the Fantasy Fiction Fanatic community. So go ahead and click the subscribe button. We would love to have you, of course, if you'd like to join us. All right, let's start off with the first trope. And I feel like this is one of the most common ones, and that would be prophecies. Most fantasies or at least a lot of them for high fantasies, include prophecies. We've got several examples like Sword of Truth, we've got the Bill Garrett series, Sword of Shannara, Wheel of Time, A Song of Fire and Ice. So as you can see, a lot of the very big classic fantasy stories do include prophecies. And this, I feel like, gives the story a framework. It gives the characters something to work towards, a end goal, a big event that's going to be coming up that they have to prepare for. Something that it's like, okay, this is supposed to happen and whether we want it to happen or don't want it to happen, we have to then prepare. And it's the driving force and the framework of the plot of a story. So overall, I think that this trope though it is done a lot, is always super interesting. It's interesting to see what they want to have happen, what they don't want to have happen, to see how they react to, you know, the prophecy, whether they're just going to accept it, whether they, you know, are going to try and work for it, just their reactions in general and the, the characters, as well as it's a really interesting dynamic to think about what is fate. Are you fated to have something happen to you or are you you know able to choose your own destiny you know can you subvert the universe and what the universe is telling you so I think it's super interesting it does make things high stakes and I like that aspect of it I like the unknown of whether fate is going to conquer or the characters will conquer and now you might say that a lot of times prophecies come true um, no matter what happens, and you might say that fate wins a lot. However, I feel like that's not always the case. And I think that even the times that it does happen, it's not always in the way that you think. So it still has that surprise element of like, oh, this prophecy said this, but it came true in a way that was unexpected. Or, hey, fate came true, but despite it coming through, they were able to then subvert it afterwards and make things work out the way they wanted. Or vice versa where you know they think that they failed and they you know weren't able to change fate um, and sometimes that's how stories go like sort of Shannara sometimes they win but sometimes they lose and sometimes it's a dark story um, sometimes it doesn't work out the way that we want and I think that sometimes the stories where it's not for sure a guaranteed win is actually more interesting and more high stakes than the ones where they're like, okay, we just have to make sure this happens. Uh, so I really like the different elements and the different ways that these prophecies can come true, as well as it giving a nice dynamic to the story to have a goal, to have an end result already kind of fresh in our minds and in the characters' motivations. Second one um, kind of goes along with the prophecy is often uh, comparable. And that is to be born with a destiny. So that means our main character uh, usually is born for greatness or born to fulfill the prophecy or in some way born to have a fate that is already decided for them by the universe. Like Sword of Shannara, uh, the Belgarid, we've got Sword of Truth, um, the Dark Sword trilogy, um, the Furies of Calderon, these are all stories that have that element where they were born to be great or born for um, this destiny that the world has or to fulfill a prophecy. This one, I think, is usually the trope is that they start off really humble and they grew up not knowing their destiny 
and of course then they discover it. It's very rare I find that the stories that have this element have the characters know and like specifically trained to have this destiny. And I think overall it's Again, it's kind of nice in the fact with the prophecy that it gives a framework and it gives something that you know is going to happen in the future for this character. And it's interesting to see that dynamic of like, okay, they were started off in this humble environment, but the universe knew that they were meant for more. And how do they handle that growing greatness or that destiny that is then shoved onto their shoulders? Um, so it's interesting to see that character and to see what kind of person they become with the... Uh, experience that comes with you know the adventure and the traveling and getting them where they need to go but I also just think it's interesting to see the fact that we can kind of live a little bit in these stories is that we are humble everyday people and it's exciting to be able to put yourself in those shoes and to be like hey even though I started uh, as a reader um, in a humble place but I can also you know have this destiny that's going to be amazing and to affect a lot of people or the world. So I think that this trope kind of gives us as the reader an experience or a way to experience the fact that just because you start off in one place, that doesn't mean that you can't rise up to have an amazing future and to be somebody important and to be somebody who ha does great things in the future. So I like the the way that you can kind of immerse yourself in it. I like the structure. I like that it can really push the story forward. So I think there's a lot of good elements for this trope. Even though it is done a lot and it is a little bit predictable, I do still think that it holds a lot of value and it does have a lot of excitement to it, especially if you really like the main character who is destined for great. Moving on to number three, and that is uh, kind of in a different direction. There are many high fantasies where there are a group of heroes, and it's like it takes a whole team, a whole band of people, in order to reach the amazing goal that is defeating evil, uh, which is usually <laughs> for the high fantasies. Uh, goal is, is to defeat some kind of evil entity or something that's going to hurt the world. So... Examples of this is going to be like Dragonlance, Belgarid, which I think it's interesting because Belgarid has like the character who is born for greatness, but then it also has the group that is also required in order to get there. And then like Lord of the Rings. Um, so these three are like a good set that like show like this is a group that is meant to is needed in order to get the end result. Even though, you know, in a lot of these, this uh, band of people kind of break apart for a while or have to go their own directions, but really all of them are necessary in order for the end result to be the end result. Um, I think it's super interesting dynamic. It's different than the Born with a Destiny, even though, yes, we have like Belgarid I mentioned where they have both elements to it. But I do feel like the feeling is different than ones that just have the born with a destiny trope. This trope really has a band of characters that you're supposed to like and be immersed with. And the cohesion of the group and how well it works uh, is going to be the driving factor of whether they can get to the end, if they can manage it. And I really like how it has a pre uh, presentation of having lots of different characters where we can really absorb those characters and really pick and choose who our favorites are. I'm not saying that not all of them are great. I mean, for example, Dragonlance, all of them are great. <laughs> but you can really connect to those certain few or connect to them in different ways depending on what kind of character they are. You can really see the dynamics between them and so it gives it a bit more, uh, character-wise, a bit more dynamic that you can kind of really absorb yourself into the book through these characters. You can see where they break apart and you're wondering, oh my gosh, are we going to make it? When they come together, you can see that incredible strength that they have as a whole. And you can just really see where the story is taking you and you can uh, invest in all elements of it because you have characters that you like in different places as well as when they're all together. So I think it just adds a different dynamic to this idea of 
instead of just one main character, we've got a bunch of characters and they're all important and they all have value for their own reasons. And I really like that, especially as somebody who, you know, what reads books and, and the, one of the things that's the main connection point for me is the character. How well do I like the characters? Because if I don't like your characters, it's very hard for me to be invested in the book unless you just have like the most amazing plot in the world. <laughs> So overall, I think it has its pluses. I do think it also has its minuses sometimes in the fact that sometimes having too many characters can kind of bog you down or you can kind of miss key things because you're so busy seeing so many different uh, people doing things. So I think it has to be done really well, <laughs> which is not always easy um, in order for it to be a big success. But I do like how it has that different dynamic than just the main one main character or just the, you know two main characters that really hold the whole story instead of having you know like five or six uh is a really interesting different kind of dynamic to it okay next is the trope of magical swords uh, magical swords i think are important in fantasy just because the sword is like the pinnacle weapon in fantasy that's what you usually think of is being a knight or um, being in the version of a world that doesn't have the main technology of like guns and stuff like that and that the sword is the prime mighty weapon um, examples of this is gonna be like sword of truth sword of Shannara and the dark sword trilogy these all three are examples that have magical swords that have a purpose in the story um, I think that it's interesting with the magical swords because usually the dynamic is that one character in particular is supposed to use this sword. And that often kind of goes along with the fact that one character born with a destiny and that's usually how we've got the sword user. Um, that's going to be that magical sword. It's not usually just anybody off the street is having magical swords. <laughs> So it kind of pairs a little bit with that destiny kind of character or just someone who is a very special person. And that is why they get to use this very significant magical sword. So it kind of goes along with just having that, that idea of that that's the tool that the character of destiny needs in order to complete their mission and to triumph over evil. You could say potentially Bill Garrett has this trope as well, except I didn't include it in this list of examples because really it's the orb that's magical part, even though it's connected to a sword, it's not really the sword that's magical. But, you know, I know that some people do consider Bill Garrett part of that kind of trope. Um, what do I think about this one? I think like a lot of these, <laughs> all of them so far I've usually liked. And that's because I think I have different stories that all include these that I do like. And so it's kind of hard to be like, that trope's dumb. <laughs> because uh, a lot, there's all, all of these are from, uh, at least in some aspect, in a story that I like. So for the Magical Swords, I think that this one is cool for the effect. Like I do think the idea of like a magical weapon is just cool. <laughs> So it's not really about it being a magical sword and it really doesn't have anything for me to do with the fact that it is connected to that magical or not magical, that uh, important person. I just think the fact that a sword being able to, you know, shoot lightning or something is an awesome idea. <laughs> it's more of a theatrics kind of thing and the more of the practical, like that is awesome kind of thing than it is for the trope itself. Um, of course, different swords have different abilities and different reasons that they exist for the story. Like Dark Sword, it's all about absorbing magic and it's about being a weapon to fight magic users. And Sword of Truth is more about the person wielding it and how the magic of the sword is more about the seeker who is in charge of wielding it. Um, but I just think the idea of a magical weapon that can do more than just parry another blade or, you know, be in battle is super cool. So that's more about what I like about it. It's more of the superficial reason than the actual dynamic that it provides in the story. But I don't know. I'm just being honest. What about you guys? On the magical swords, what is the real reason that you like them? Is it because 
or, or is there a reason that you don't like it? Is it because that they're cool? Is it because that you think that they're just a dumb aspect of a book? Um, what is your thoughts? Like, I really, I'm really a little bit superficial on this one. <laughs> just being honest. All right, number five is the fact that evil characters are so often dressed in black cloaks. Like, I swear, Lord of the Rings has this. Sword of Shannara has this. Belgarid has this. Harry Potter has this. Anything that's evil or an evil person seems to be like, here's a black cloak, let me don it. <laughs> yeah, it's like the traditional evil guy look and it is so overdone. But it does make sense in the fact that evil works in the shadows. Um, evil usually is represented by dark colors. Evil is, and, and, and you know, not even just evil, but just like connivers, um, people who are trying to work behind the scenes where they're not noticed, so they're being sneaky, is all about being dark, unseen, you know, kind of goes with the territory of trying to be the opposite of the good and the light. But it is way overdone, and in some cases, it's really cool. I do think that this trope does have aspects of it that are good and cool, and they are very traditional. We are hardwired, I feel like, at this point to just see Black Cloak, boom, evil. I do like when uh, authors do kind of subvert this trope where it's like, it seems like they're an evil person because they're wearing the Black Cloak, but then later they're revealed to be a good person. Um, this was done a little bit in Lord of the Rings, not with the Black Cloak, but like when uh, they first meet Aragorn, he's like in the corner, in the dark, in the shadow, and you're just like, oh my gosh, he's that guy, and they're like, oh my gosh, he's so dangerous, and then later he's, you find out he's actually a really good guy, but at first it was that dark shadow, you know, unknown kind of feel that made them feel like maybe he was an enemy, so I feel like this trope has its place, and I do feel like in general, it can be an interesting one and you can, it can even be interesting because you know that they're the bad guy and you're just wondering how things are going to work out. But I do feel like this one is done a lot and it is very known. So sometimes it can just be like, oh yeah, that's the bad guy. All right, let's just get on with it. So this is the one that I can see. Sometimes it's really cool. Sometimes it's got its aspects and then sometimes it's just overdone and it's just thrown in there because we're hardwired to think black, shrouded in black, equals bad. And, the, you know, sometimes then we're, we're subverted our expectations, and that is always exciting to me, is when the expectations are subverted. So this one, again, it has its good parts. It's got its, you know, kind of just, it's a trope part. But I do think it does have its place, and it does have some ways to refresh it and make it new. And last but not least, we've got our trope of having a wizard as the guide character. The biggest example of this is Lord of the Rings. You know, we've got Gandalf, who is their guide character. Um, we've got Belgarid that has this, Sword of Shannara has this, Sword of Truth has this, Wheel of Time has this. So we've got it a lot, where the wise, knowledgeable, worldly person is the wizard, and that wizard then takes the people who are more naive, less knowledgeable, teaches them about the world, guides them through their journey, takes them where they need to go. Um, I don't know if it's because of the powers that they have and that is what makes them the good guide character. Um, that makes them, you know, more wise because they have more power and so they see more of the responsibility that the world needs to have. But whatever the case, it usually ends up being the wizard character. Um, I mean, I think it, maybe this is because I'm hardwired. I've seen so many uh, books that have this, but it kind of makes sense to me that the person who knows the world and knows mo more about the politics and the way that things work would be the guide character. And it just so happens that a lot of times the wizard is that person. Um, I do think it's cool because they can use magic to help in their journey, but it doesn't necessarily have to be that they're always the guide character for that to be the case. For example, Dragonlance, they have a wizard in their party who is not their guide. It is a different character who's their guide character. 
Um, and they still, you know, use their wizard for battle and to help them out when needed. So it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be the guide character in order to have their moments of cool wizardy. <laughs> but a lot of times that is the case, that they are the guide character. And I just think that it just depends on the kind of story being told. This one's kind of neutral for me because it can be done either way. Of course, I do think it's super cool when the guide character, you know, like Gandalf and um you know bill garrett but you know like like does this magical thing that then it's like so cool and everyone else is in awe and then they're like oh my gosh you're so amazing <laughs> and you know does that in their their way of guiding them and in their way of teaching them i do think that that's that it does have its cool moments but i don't think that necessarily this trope has to be presented in order for it to be a good story and to have a good use of a wizard or anything else. I just think it comes a lot of times with the territory of what the magical system is. If there's only a few people that can be a wizard or a witch or a magic user, I find that those are the characters that usually end up being the guide because it's so few and it's such a niche thing that they have. And the kind of stories that make it where, you know, it's it's not necessarily, it doesn't have to be super common, but it also doesn't limit too much on how many people can use magic those are the ones that don't generally use that trope so either way i think it just depends on the world i think it depends on the story being told and how that author wants to tell it and it could be good and it could be good to not have them as the wizard guide it just depends on the story so there you are those are six common fantasy tropes that I thought of that are typically in high fantasies. I would love to hear your thoughts on them, whether you like them, whether you don't like them, whether you think they're too done, whether you think that you want them more, whatever it may be. I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions. And yeah, I hope that you enjoyed this kind of talk and just thinking about it. And I hope that you'll share your thoughts with me. And I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye!